So we have a uh, six members of our bargaining team with us today who are going to be sharing some of their experiences um, on uh, as members of the bargaining team and also talking about what a fair pay offer would mean to them. So I'll just get you to introduce yourselves one by one and talk about what your role is and how long you've been a health worker for. I will go to Steve. Here you go, um, Steve Grant. I'm a sterilising technician up in Northland, DHB. Um, been in the role for about 12 years. Um, I guess the main thing that a fair pay offer would mean would be, you know, recognition for my work and recognition for, you know, our, our work and, and be able to actually not, you know, um, rely on overtime and stuff like that. Um, and Steve, can you share with us what has your employer given you this month to say thank you for being an essential worker? A um, uh, small coffee and some little droplets and stuff, nothing to do major. So would you say that a small coffee and some little chocolates is a suitable alternative to a fair pay deal? Definitely not. Definitely no, not. Absolutely no not. Sorry. <clears throat> uh, and so, Lloyd, if you are listening right now, I've just resent you your link to um, become a panellist, so check your inbox. Uh, next up is Janet. Janet, please introduce yourself. Kia ora, I'm Janet Quigley, and I work for the Regional Public Health Unit as a health promoter based in Timaru. And some of you may recognise Janet as Benedict's predecessor as the president of the PSA. Uh, and we're all very thankful that Janet appears to have lost her mind and hasn't um, put her feet up yet and is continuing on the bargaining team. And Janet, what has your employer given you to say thank you for being the central worker this month? Well, we must have been some of the lucky ones because, um, well, in my workplace, we got a $20 voucher to buy coffee or petrol um, at a garage and we got a cookie. Aren't we lucky? But you know, that's really hardly sufficient when our staff have been in the thick of COVID work for the past two years. So would you say that was a suitable alternative to a fair pay deal? No, I wouldn't. You know, we've been working doing contract tracing, case investigating, daily monitoring, working in MIQ and border facilities. And, and all of us have changed our work patterns to, to keep these services going um, over the weekends public holidays you know and while we accept working in public health is about readiness to cope with emergencies this is just long and protracted it's gone over over two years and it's not over yet so no a cookie and a voucher is not enough i'm seeing a theme emerging here uh we have now been joined by uh sue so welcome sue uh please introduce yourself oh, sorry you're... well I, yeah. I was just going to finish <laughs> oh sorry because I've got some very important, you know, things to tell people. You know, many of our, our, our staff are really tired, frustrated, burnt out. And, you know, they're leaving in numbers like I've never seen leave before. Um, and, and the new staff taking on the roles and the remaining staff, uh, this is just putting them under huge amount of pressure. And the offer that we've been given doesn't even keep up with inflation. So what they're really asking us to do is take a pay cut, which I'm not prepared to do. And it's really ironic. I didn't say, but I've been working in the health system for over 50 years, and I started my career as a dental nurse. And at the start of that, I marched on Parliament in the early 70s in the fight to be valued and what's happening now, at the end, towards the end of my career, 50 years later, still working in allied health, and we're still facing the same challenge to be recognised and valued. It's just not good enough. Yeah, thank you, Janet. Now uh, I have finished. <laughs> okay, Sue, go ahead. Um, I'm Sue. I'm a medical laboratory scientist, and I've been in my current role for 27 years. Um, and and the, the current pay offer is rubbish. And what has um, your employee what has your employer given you, Sue, to say thank you for being an essential health worker this month? We got given um, for our work during COVID, we got given a twenty dollar cafe voucher to use in the cafes at the hospital, and we also got a um, cookie time cookie, and all of that was really nice. But it really doesn't meet the needs of um, inflation and the needs of our hard work that we put in. So during the um, COVID, we've had a momentous amount of work. It's just been extreme. Right from the beginning, the pressure's been on to perform 
or the COVID tests. Um, the public doesn't realise the amount of work that goes into actually do, um, processing and resulting all of those tests. We um, had limited staff. Yes, we have got more staff, but the pressure has really been on. And so people are doing a lot of overtime, they're changing their hours, they're working you know, weekends, evenings, night shift. They've gone from the Monday to Friday in some of the labs to working 24-7. This has put a lot of pressure on the staff, but it's also put a lot of pressure on the families. People aren't there for the families. Their home time's gone. You know, we're talking about this is the third year. That pressure is really now taking the toll on families and on staff. There are people that are getting sick now because of COVID and it's, you know, more in Canterbury now more than ever. Um, but also they're getting tired and run down. And so people are leaving. They've had enough. But, you know, unfortunately, that just puts more and more pressure on the rest of us. The, the pressure and continuous stress over the last three years has really taken its toll on us. And some people have come back and said, hey, look, you guys look so old. <laughs> You've aged 10 years and three years. So the amount of money that the government's offering us now is just really an insult. It's a slap. There's no, no um, big bonus or that you'd get in the private sector or no big thank you for all the hard work we've done. And so, you know, we're really being offered a, a slap in the face and being told that, no, actually, we're going to give you a negative pay increase. We know you worked hard, but you don't really deserve any more money. So as well as being really insulting, it's really um, humiliating, especially, you know, when you're going back to your families and they're saying, but, you know, you haven't been around. You've done all this work over the last few years. And now your employer doesn't recognise that. So it's been really difficult. Yeah, thank you, Sue. Um, and next up, we have Andy representing um, mental health staff. Oh, kia ora, everyone. Uh, my name's Andy Cowell. I'm a social worker working in the crisis team at Auckland District Health Board. And I am now in my 26th year of working at ADHB. So, Andy, what did your employer give you to say thank you for being the central worker for 26 years? I was given some interesting food choices. So I got a packet of twisties, which I think is meant to show how much respect the DHB shows for me. And I also got a packet of shapes, which I think is meant to show how much they value me as a worker. And is that a suitable alternative to a fair pay offer, Andy? Uh, well, I'm not addicted to twisties or shapes, so uh, <laughs> no, not at all. Nope, so we've got a theme developing here. And um, next up is Diana. Yes, kia ora, everyone. Um, I'm a community occupational therapist at Mid-Central Health and based over in Dennyburg. And I've been in that position um, 26 years now. And this is my, my favourite one. Diana, what did you get from your employer to say thank you for being the central worker? So those of us at Mid-Central Health, we're still waiting to be given anything. <laughs> we haven't got anything yet. So is that a suitable alternative to a fair pay offer? Uh, no. <laughs> Thank you, Diana. And last but not least is uh, Matua, uh, Alan and Fire Teresa. Oh, kia ora world. Thank you very much for this there. Um, it's a great sort of privilege to kind of be in this group there. And um, my name's Alan Franks. My people are from Ngāpui and uh, Ngāti Manipoto. Um, I'm presently working at the ADHB at Tikitu Tawara as a kaiatapai. But hey, look, I've worked in mental health, Māori mental health there for now on 20 years. So it's been seven years in the Canterbury District Health Board um, and 13 years in Auckland District Health Board. So that's a suitable alternative to a fair pay offer. Um, look, I just have to say there for us there that we've always been, um, there's been a contest between cultural roles and clinical roles. And I think the support has always been for the clinical roles of preference there. So this is kind of how come we kind of sit more often on the, um, on the low scales. I think the difficulties that we have about sort of moving through the scales though, is the wretched um, CASP framework. Um, it was designed not by Māori, um, and so there's, we're not able to kind of really look at it from a whakapanaunga point of view, from our experience in that way. I think some of the things that we come with, our specialised skills, 
Um, it's to do with the whakapapa that we have there that makes us able to have that relationship with our Māori folk there. That, and I think kind of when we've just gone through this in, inquiry about the inequities that sit with Māori, um, if there were more Māori on board there, that we could probably have less of these kind of these examples that that's not working. So that comes back to things like safe staffing for staff. How come we can, we've only got two FTEs in the service at the moment in Auckland uh, for a 58 bed, a 58 bedded unit. And our, our percentages are easily 20%, which is way above our 10% of so average. Um, I think that's probably enough for me to kind of start off. Do you want to ask me some questions? Well, all right, child Alan, yeah, we'll get to the questions soon. I'd, I'd just um, ask Teresa if she'd like to add anything to what you've just said. Um, Kahoe, Alan, Tumako, sorry, Kiss Clucky from um, from BHP. Um, it's not much more like you say, um, well, Emily, um, it's really hard weighing up Māori to generic, let's just say generic stuff. Um, we've been having a lot of discussions in our own space and it doesn't seem to marry. We seem to be still at the bottom of the... I'm Kayafina, so my basis work is with Māori people, but I, what I, if you ring me up, I'll come to you and I'll help you. Um, we seem to be left at the bottom of the... Of the hill. Not knowing that we're home Māori or just plain old workers, community health workers. Um, um, so back to Steve and Steve um, I said before is International Sterile Sciences Day but our sterile supplies uh, members are among our lowest paid members can you um, talk to us a bit about how that impacts you and your colleagues yeah well we're, we're qualified um, health professionals yet we're not recognized as that and we're paid very low and we um I have to work a second job to support my family. Um, there's nothing nothing left to encourage us to stay in the profession or, or work in the profession. And a lot of people were leaving the profession to work at KFC or Bunnings or McDonald's because you actually get more money working there than you do working for the DHB. That leaves a lot of work left for the remaining people that are, are stuck or choose to stay at the DHBs. We end up doing a lot of overtime, a lot of evenings and a lot of cool. The DHBs rely on us doing the overtime to actually run their theatre lists. Because we're so low paid, we're always going to jump at any overtime that's offered to us. So we actually end up working six to seven days in a row, um, which is not good for family time. You know, as I say, I already work a second, so I hardly ever see my family. You know, a fair pay deal would mean that, you know, we could actually live instead of just surviving. We're just um, a matter of life and death for us, really. We're, we're just carrying on as much as we can, breaking through not being able to pay bills um, with, a, you know, one of the lowest paid professions in the DHP. Okay, thank you, Steve. Uh, Andy, as a mental health professional, do you feel valued by your employer? Uh, no, not at all. Um, in mental health, like in every other part of the service, uh, allied uh, staff are the forgotten workforce, I think. Um, while we appreciate our, that our mental health nursing colleagues, um, I really appreciate what they do. Uh, they work under extremely difficult conditions like us and deserve a lot more support like us. However, when the government or when the government pledges millions of dollars to increasing mental health nursing numbers while completely ignoring allied workers, it makes me feel really invisible and completely undervalued. The DHBs in Auckland are saying that we should be returning to business as usual. Uh, but one month on from the outbreak, or the Omicron out outbreak, it still hasn't ended for us as workers. We still have lots of colleagues who are off work with COVID, and we still have to carry out with all the usual precautions in place, uh, which adds to our already incredibly busy workloads. And that doesn't look like it's going to end anytime soon. Um, we constantly work in an environment where you're under-resourced, overworked, under underpaid, and quite frankly, exploited. And that is business as usual for us. Nothing is going to change until the government puts a pay offer on the table that is going, going to guarantee a fair pay. Otherwise, we will continue to be chronically understaffed, under-resourced and exploited. Thank you, Andy, but at least you have your shape, so. I do, that's right. <laughs> and um, Diana, how are you seeing the impact of low pay and vacancies and undervaluation in your day-to-day -day work? 
we we constantly have vacancies. In fact, I can't remember a, a, a time recently where we've been uh, fully staffed without vacancies. We just um, and we have to carry those vacancies on on top of our already huge workloads. You know, we have um, significant waiting lists in the community where I work. Um, in our our clients, they're more complex. They're requiring um, longer input, more significant input, um, and, and then we're having to carry vacancies and, and as Andy said, you know, increased sick leave in that at the moment as we have staff coming and going as they get and recover from COVID. Um, we're losing our experienced staff. Um, you get, you're getting younger staff in, which is which is great. But um, the early on in their professional careers, they require further training or um, interviews, getting up to speed, educating, getting their enable accreditation, um, and just with losing that experience, as a, a colleague said to me last week, you know, you can't teach experience. Experience is, is invaluable. And then to top it all off, we get places like Australia that are just you know, they're, they're actively recruiting over here. You know, I, I got an email myself for a community position in Australia, same as what I'm doing now. The starting salary was more than what I'm earning now. It topped out at over 100K. And then on top of that, they said, and that salary is part of a complete remuneration package that that is, is um, you know, between 100 and 120K. You know, I mean, if I was young, 20 years younger, I'd be gone. Who, who would blame them? And yeah, we, we're just having to carry that all the time. It's exhausting. Thank you, Diana. And um, back to Alan and Teresa. So um, the the members on our high water Maori scales are an exclusively Maori group, um, but you are in a unique circumstance where uh, you have to jump through various hoops in order to do things like prove your cultural qualifications in order to access higher pay scales. Otherwise, you hit a ceiling where you're on extremely low pay and extremely limited wage progression. So as representatives of a group that is almost entirely made up of Māori, how does it feel for you to be in that position? Kia ora, Will. Um, I think from our point of view there, and it's right across the, the, the whole health sector and really across the public services as well, but especially with our bargaining there, that we did talk about um, the things here that we're required to do outside of our job description. And there's no merit given for it. There's nothing to kind of show there that people are valued accordingly there. Um, I think when I spoke to the Komatu about, you know, what was the reasonable remuneration for any of the things there that over and above what our job is, he just says, well, you know, I think if anything there for a fair payoff, or we just need to draw the line in the sand because the people that provide those, those services there are expert in what they deliver. And that's not, so that's not measured or monitored successfully in the, in the, wage scale. So that's the beginning of the beginning of our discussion for the next lot of bargaining, I dare say. Thank you, Alan. And Teresa, if we've got you back, do you have anything to add to that? Um, <clears throat> it's really hard, you know, well, because um, in Tikanga and Tripi, we don't put a, a monetary value on our Tikanga, but when we're working in the world that we are, we've had to compromise, we've had to adapt, and so now we think it's hard for us to do our stuff and be asking non Māori to reward us, you know. So you, you go in there and I can say with my hand on heart that I'm a kaikanga and I'm a waiata person and I will stand and sue Pite Kōrero you with the marae ātea i daro te maru o te whare, you know, because that's me. And I'm asked to do that times and I'm asked to do care, kind of but at the end of the day my thank you is a cup of tea. Now when we look at that and we look at a, a what is it, a, a DLA, well, you know, money, money can't take a hat off, but you can take that other hat off. We're forever in mind, we're forever the first person you've been asked to stand up and mahi a te mahi o te māori. It's hard. It's hard to take a little back to our people to say, I'm sorry, we can't help you. You have to go and ask your manager to value 
um, to add the value to your tikanga. And nine times out of ten, our managers are not Māori. Or they're Māori and they don't go home to the Māori. Kwena noi o That's all I've got to say um, about that. Thank you, Teresa. And yes, one, one issue that has been um, front and centre on the bargaining table is the uh, idea that many of our Māori members and our Hawaii Māori members are um, putting in significant kind of cultural labour that isn't part of their job description uh, that they are not getting paid for. Uh, and ensuring that you are not exploited in that way is incredibly important. And Alan, um, I realised I forgot to ask you, what did you get given by your employer uh, to say thank you for being the central health worker? They got nearly what Andy got. <laughs> he got, nearly got what he got. But hey, um, on top of everything, we got a Mr. Whippy ice cream. <laughs> and, and we got told they were considering a, um, a noodle run. So uh, look forward to a, a sort of a, a instant noodles, I suppose, the two minute ones that come in a packet. My goodness. Would, would you say that was a suitable alternative to a fair pay offer? Oh, well, I quite like noodles there, so <laughs> it just depends if it's those really spicy ones. Oh, I like the spicy ones. Oh, well, you're, you're like, as long as you don't try and get Andy's shapes off him, I think you'll be fine. <laughs> uh, well, I, keep an eye on him. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you so much to um, Teresa. I think you just put yourself on mute then. But thank you so much to all of um, our representatives from the bargaining team for sharing your experiences today. And I hope that that shows all of you watching uh, doesn't that demonstrates not only the incredible range of roles that we have under this agreement from sterile services technicians to our order Māori workers, but should also show you that regardless of where you are, who you are, what your profession is, or what you earn, that, um, that you are not alone in your experiences and that there are 10,000 uh, of our allied health workers around the country who share the same concerns and issues and struggles that you have.